Hello. Welcome to the first meeting of the research seminar The Penetration of Arabic Philosophy into the Latin Philosophical Tradition, 1162-1215, organized by the Aquinas and the Arabs International Working Group. I am Nicola Polloni from Durham University, and I will briefly introduce you to some relevant aspects of the crucial event which took place in the second half of the 12th century, the Toledan Translation Movement. Before doing so, and in order to understand the reasons why the translation movement developed and why in Toledo, we have to go back over a few decades and have a glimpse of what has been called by Charles Homer Haskins the 12th century renaissance. The cultural renaissance that characterizes the 12th century has many facets and goes from architecture to political institutions to science and literature. Regarding a history of the genesis of the translation movement, the crucial event whose importance should be stressed here is the Gregorian reform. A series of ecclesiastical reforms put in place from 1046 to 1122 by the papacy and Pope Gregorius VII in particular, and aimed at reshaping the Church in a more centralized fashion and with an improvement of the action and presence of the clergy in the dioceses. Among the various resolutions of this reform, one is extremely important as for the long-lasting effects that will have. The papacy urged the dioceses to provide a sufficient ecclesiastical education to the clergy in order to contrast the progressive expansion of many heretical movements and strengthen the clerical action on the very dioceses. The first effect of this urgency was the establishment of cathedral schools in almost every cathedral, even though not at the very same time, in which the clergy could receive a basic education. Leaving apart the monastic schools, the phenomenon of the cathedral schools will be accompanied very soon by the establishment of similar institutions in towns. And this is the institutional landscape from which, a few decades later, the universities will rise. The 12th century philosophical and scientific debate, thus, is directly bound to some schools and centers of primary importance. Chartres, Salerno, Laon, Paris, Herford, just to mention the most famous of them. In the Ile-de-France, possibly the most important center where philosophy was dealt with, one can easily identify two main tendencies characterizing those schools. The interest on logic, peculiar of Paris and still based on the logica vetus, developed through the harsh debate between nominalists and realists, and the interest on natural philosophy, typical of Chartres, and performed in concordance with and as explaining item of the biblical text from a Timaeus-based perspective. If we look at these discussions and debates from a far-reaching viewpoint, we can easily notice the narrowness of the sources upon which these philosophers base their speculations. This fact constituted a substantial limit for the philosophers, and they were quite conscious of this lack of authorities and sources. On the one hand, indeed, the activities of, the, of other centers and one for all Salerno, were based on the new scientific and predominantly medical writings acquired by a first translating effort pursued at the beginning of the century by translators as Constantine the African and Alphanus of Salerno. These quite pioneering works were soon followed by the rise of a Greek into Latin translation movement, based in Sicily, southern Italy and the Byzantine territories, that will provide also the very first new Latin translations of some important works by Aristotle, thanks to James of Venice. On the other hand, the frustration for the lack of sources and authorities, books and authors, is expounded in a strong and enveloping way by the very translators of the time. For instance, Plato of Tivoli, in the prologue to his translation of Albertani de Scientia Stellarum, affirms in vivid terms that 
the darkness of ignorance of the Latin people must be deplored, as much as their indifference toward their own idleness must be reproached. Rome, in truth, as for the art schools and the, and the reflections on knowledge, displays its inferiority not only to Egypt and Greece, but also to Arabia. This fact could be easily seen regarding the other arts that the Latins, if they possess them, they do so by borrowing them not from themselves, but from other people. But this is above all manifest from the consideration of the aforementioned signs of the stars, of which, I mean, the Latins do not dare to offer any authority, not a single translator that venture upon offer there to the Latins. This is an example of the commonly felt perception of a kind of cultural backwardness of the Latin culture in comparison to the Arabic one. These feelings are variously attested in the prologues and dedicatory letters accompanying the translations of the time. The translators were aiming exactly at filling this gap on Latin knowledge, translating into Latin books and authors that could crucially contribute to the development of Latin science and philosophy. In a similar fashion, Dominicus Cundisalinus describes the bleak state of teaching in Europe in his prologue to his version of Al-Farabi's The Sanctis, stating that, while home, when the philosophers were many, among them only the person who was believed to have a firm comprehension of the science of every single thing was called sapiens. On the contrary, nowadays, while the world is aging, no one is worth to be called sapiens, or even less philosopher, since who would like to study the sapientia can hardly find someone to do so. These accounts must be read in the stylistic context on which they are presented, as prologues or dedicatory letters in which the translator tends to stress both the relevance and the novelty of his work. All the same, they constitute precious evidences of the modalities and feelings characterizing the translations. A final example of this attitude is the passage from Abraham Im Dawood's dedicatory letter accompanying the Latin translation of Avicenna's The Anima, where we read For this reason I attended with dedication to carry out your will, my lord, to translate the book on the soul by the philosopher Avicenna, so that, thanks to your generosity and my effort, it will be more certain to the Latins what has remained unknown to them until now. That is, if the soul exists, what it is, what is its nature according to the essence and act, things verified here with the most valuable arguments. And what Imdaud says about the usefulness of the translation of Avicenna's De Anima can be extended to the common attitude of the translators toward their own work, perceived as necessary, urgent, and at some degree pioneering. These remarks on the perception of a cultural backwardness of the Latin philosophical landscape and the urgency of new texts to be translated into Latin are valid for both the Greek and the Arabic into Latin translation movements. As I was saying, the Greek into Latin translations were realized predominantly in the Mediterranean area between Sicily and Byzantium. For the border position of southern Italy, and Sicily in particular, where the Arab Arabic dominion left the place to the Norman rulers, whose political action was crucially bound to the Byzantine Empire. On the contrary, the Arabic into Latin translations, on which we will center our attention, were mainly based in the Iberian Peninsula, with some incursions beyond the Pyrenees and later with Michael Scott in Sicily. Iberia, another border region of Europe, divided between Christian and Islamic rulers, often allied to each other in opposition to the common contemporary idea of Reconquista as clash of civilizations. By a historical viewpoint, the rise and apex of the Iberian translation movement is enclosed between two fundamental events, the taking of Toledo in 1085 and the Battle of Las Navas de Tolosa in 1212. 
nonetheless, an effective comprehension of the socio-political context on which the translation movement began needs a wider glance. In 1031, with the position of Hisham III, the Umayyad Caliphate in Al-Andalus is abolished. With the end of the Caliphate begins one of the most dramatic phases in the history of Al-Andalus, known as the Reinos de Taifa. The provinces that once composed the Caliphate proclaimed their independence, giving birth to dozens of city-states to the height of 39. All of them were in war with each other, enjoying different kinds of alliances and vassalage with the Christian kingdoms of Castile and Aragon. The situation of the Iberian Peninsula during the 11th and basically also a good part of the 12th century was quite different from the usual narrative of the Reconquista, and this is for there was no Reconquista, not yet. This effort, if we could call it in this way, even though it's quite inappropriate, will begin only after an enveloping process of moral suasion operated by the papacy and, to be precise, the very first event of the Reconquista is possibly the aforementioned Battle of Las Navas de Tolosa in 1212. Before that, the Islamic and Christian rulers were often allied to each other against other Christian and Islamic kingdoms, and in many cases they were bound together by vassalage bonds. A clear example of this situation is provided by the very taking of Toledo, an event whose consequences will be white. Toledo was the former capital of the Visigoth kingdom, taken by the Arabs in 713. On May the 25th, 1085, Alfonso VI of Castile enters the city and proclaims himself Imperator Totius Hispania. Toledo surrendered to Castile on May the 6th, but the circumstances of this taking are quite curious. A few years before, while Alfonso was fighting his own brother Sancho II, he needed to shelter in Toledo, ruled by its vassal and allied Al-Qadir. Soon after that, the Emir of Badajoz took Toledo, and Al-Qadir allied again with Alfonso to take back the city, but with a quite peculiar agreement. Alfonso will integrate Toledo to the kingdom of Castile, while Al-Qadir will leave the city to become king of Valencia. And this is what actually happened when the city of Toledo surrendered to the Castilian troops in 1085. We will go back to Toledo very soon, since it is in that city that the Arabic into Latin translation movement will find its most eminent center. What's important to stress now is that for the symbolic value of the event, the peaceful taking of Toledo was seen as a kind of scandal by the most powerful rulers of the Reinos de Taifa. Consequently, the Emir of Seville, Al-Mutamid, asked the Almoravid dynasty to, for help. From their capital, Marrakesh, the Almoravids accepted the request for help and soon landed in Al-Andalus. By 1111, the Reinos de Taifa were assimilated to the Almoravid kingdom, but the Islamic army couldn't take back Toledo, even though they did take back Zaragoza, which became their capital for a few years. Nonetheless, the Almoravid power wasn't enough strong to stabilize the political situation of Al-Andalus, and between 1143 and 1147 the Almoravid domination fell and a second period of Reinos de Taifa began. This fragmented political situation is the scenario on which the first generation of Arabic into Latin translators worked in the Iberian Peninsula up to the middle of the 12th century. The first stage of the translation movement is marked by at least two fundamental characteristics. In the first place, the translators are disseminated throughout the whole peninsula, from the Ebro Valley to Seville and Barcelona, to southern France. Moreover, this stage saw the translators working almost exclusively on scientific texts, predominantly of astronomical issue. In a few decades, more than a hundred of treatises and works on these disciplines were made available to the Latin scholars. Let me just recall a few of them, beginning with Hermann of Carinthia. Coming from Dolmetia, 
Hermann studied in Shot with theory, and once he learned Arabic, he moved to the Iberian Peninsula where he has, at least from 1133. Often in collaboration with Robert of Ketchen, Hermann works to the translation of many Arabic scientific works, among which we should recall at least Theodosius Sferica and Abu Mashar's Introductorius Maius. Peter the Venerable, abbot of Cluny, commissioned the translation of some Islamic writings with an apologetic purpose, and Hermann and Robert realized the notorious Degenerazione Mahomet, Doctrina Mahomet, Chronica Mendoza Saracenorum, and the Alcoranus Latinus, translated by Robert. Moreover, in 1143, Hermann writes in Bézieux an original philosophical writing, the De Essences, in which he condensed the knowledge acquired by the writings he translated with the Chartrian and Timaeus-based cosmological tradition, a work that will have an interesting history of the effects. Another important translator of the time is John of Seville, who was active in Seville and probably Toledo before 1150. John translated into Latin writings of important Arabic astronomers as Al-Fargani or Al-Zarqali, as well as many astrological writings as Abu Mashar's Introductorius Maius, again, and a conspicuous part of Mashallah's production. In the same years, precisely around 1145, Robert of Chester translates in Segovia al Quarismis Liber Restaurationis et Oppositionis Numeri, that is, the Aljab introducing algebra in the Latin West. But he translates also the notorious Testamentum Moriani, the first known alchemical text to be translated into Latin. Finally, in 1147, Robert is supposed to be in England, where he writes a treatise on the astrolabe, and in 1150, he adapts the astronomic tables to the latitude of London. Between 1145 and 1151, Duke of Santala translates the De Secretis Nature by Pseudo Apollonius of Tiana, the Latin Berlinus, containing the famous Tabulas Maragdina. Duke makes also available to the Latins the curious pseudo Aristotelian Liber Aristotelis de Ducento Quinquaginta Quinquendorum Voluminibus, and the anonymous hermetic work, the Spatula. In the same decade, Plato of Tivoli produces another version of the De Secretis Nature, the aforementioned Scientia Stellarum by Albatani, as well as works by Alimrani al Kayat and Ptolemy's Quadripartitum, writings focused on astrological judgment. And one should not forget the Liber Arenalis Scientiae, one of the first works on geomancy translated into Latin. As we can notice, Apart from some rare exceptions, as in Lucas' De Differentia Spiritus et Anime, there are no purely philosophical writings among the translations realized in this first stage of the translation movement. The translated writings are usually scientific works, mainly astronomical and astrological, but also writings dealing with new doctrines as alchemy, geomancy, or with the Hermetic tradition. This interest on science and astronomy is, typical, is a typical feature of the first generation of Arabic into Latin translators, and it will be progressively left apart by the second generation of translators, who will begin to translate philosophical writings into Latin, following what was already happening with the Greek into Latin translation movement. Before passing to the second generation of translators, we have to go back to the sociopolitical context of the Iberian Peninsula, for two main reasons. Indeed, the passage to the second half of the 12th century is marked by the Almohad revolution, with many crucial effects that the very history of cultural dis dissemination of knowledge. And, at the very same time, the dispersion of the translators throughout the peninsula common in the first half of the century, is superseded by the rise of Toledo as the main center of Arabic into Latin translations. As I mentioned before, the collapse of the Moravid dominion left space to a new period of Reynos de Taifa, which took place between 1143 and 1147. 
Nevertheless, the political void in Maghreb and consequently in Al-Andalus was to be filled by a new dynasty with a quite different political and cultural approach, the Almohads. This is not a place where we can duly deal with the many facets of the Almohads taking of power, but I should at least mention the religious fight that opposed the Almohad faction with its radical interpretation of the Tawhid to the Almoravid dynasty, traditionally bound to Malikism and quite tolerant. The Almohad movement, led by Al-Mumin, took Marrakesh in 1147. Al-Mumin proclaimed himself caliph and one of his first dispositions was the purge of about 30,000 supporters of the Almoravids. A bloody event that will crucially mark the change of dynasty also in Al-Andalus. Indeed, after having taken Marrakesh, the Almohad proceeds to conquer the Iberian possessions of the Almoravids. Fragmented, as I said, in a plurality of semi-independent states. In 1148, the Almohads take Cordoba. In 1154, Granada. By 1171, all the Islamic kingdoms of Al-Andalus were annexed to the Almohad Caliphate. The arrival of the Almohads and their radical policies into the Iberian Peninsula produced a shock. Many people, especially Christians and Jews, but also many Muslims, didn't feel sure anymore and fled. A migratory flux, famously exemplified by the biography of Moses ben Maimon, Maimonides, that was directed from Al-Andalus toward the south, the Maghreb or even the Mashrek, and toward north, the Iberian Christian kingdoms. And the first big city to be encountered on the north route was precisely Toledo, the Castilian capital and probably the main center in receiving this migratory flux from Al-Andalus. Indeed, Toledo was in a peculiar geopolitical position. Not far from the border with Al-Andalus, the city was well protected and at the center of the commercial routes on the peninsula. Even more important was the social composition of the Castilian capital. In the first place, we have to recall that, with the Arabic dominion, the Toledan Christians were protected by Dima as al Kitab, but all the same, they were separated by the Roman Church and its developments. When the Castilians entered Toledo, they found a Christian population of Arabic language, which liturgy was an autonomous development of the ancient Visigoth rite. They are the Mozarabes and their liturgy can be enjoyed still today at the Toledo Cathedral. The Mozarabic population of Toledo will play a crucial role during the first decades after the taking of Toledo, for their knowledge of, Arabic, of the Arabic language and custom in a city still populated by many Muslims. Nevertheless, the Mozarabic tradition was a problem for a Catholic church that was already dealing with important heretical movements. As a consequence, the urgency for a romanization of the Iberian Christian tradition was pursued by a series of French archbishops of Toledo, directly bound to Cluny, that held the Toledo archbishopric for almost a century, beginning with Bernard de Sidirac. The settling of, of a French community in Toledo is surely an important fact, marking a direct link between the Castilian capital and the French milieu. As we are going to see, this fact is even more important if we consider that the Archbishopric is supposedly the main sponsor of the very translation movement. At the very same time, we should also remember that in those decades, the Cistercian monks built some important monasteries in the Duero Valley, contributing to the repopulation of that area. Muslims, Mozarabes, French. Toledo was a multicultural town. We must recall also that Toledo hosted one of the wealthiest Jewish communities of the peninsula, and that, as capital of the Castilian kingdom, the rich town was the destination of a relevant process of Castilian migration from north. Progressively, from the end of the 11th century to the half of the 12th century, we assist to a gradual Latinization of the Toledan culture, which is witnessed by the extant writings of the period. Until 1125, the majority of the extant documents is in Arabic, the language used by the three traditional communities of Toledo, that is, 
both Arabs, Jews, and Muslims. Around 1150, with the apex of the Castilian migration to Toledo, we have a balance between a Latin and Arabic as used languages. But soon after, this balance goes back to a predominance of Arabic documents as a consequence of the migration of the Arabic-speaking population from Al-Andalus after the arrival of the Almohads. And this is, as I said before, a fundamental event. Indeed, the peak of the migration flux from Al-Andalus coincides with uh, the emergence of the Toledan translation movement. The contribution of these people, with their books, their skills, their cultures and experiences, is possibly the pivotal condition on which the translation movement will feed. And among these people moving from Al-Andalus, with all probability there is also a person that will crucially and directly contribute to the future developments of medieval philosophy, Abraham Im Dawood. We will come back to this point in a few moments. If the first factor explaining why Toledo became the main center of Arabic into Latin translation in the second half of the 12th century is the migratory flux from Al-Andalus, a second fundamental factor eminently underlined by Charles Burnett, is the transfer of the Banu Hood's library from Zaragoza to Toledo around 1140. The wide collection of scientific writings owned by the Banu Hoods seem to be directly related to Gerard of Cremona's translations, as Burnett pointed out, and its presence in Toledo surely contributed to the establishment in this town of remarkable translating activity for the availability of scientific texts. Finally, a third factor made possible the development of the translation movement in the Castilian capital, the wealth of the Toledan chapter. Both Gundis Salinos and Gerard of Cremona, the most important translators of the movement, figure as member, members of the capitulary chapter with precise, precise ecclesiastical rules, Gundis Salinos as Archidiaconus, Gerard as Magister. And this aspect suggests a certain degree of interest the prelates had toward the translations. A tendency exemplarily testified by Peter the Venerable and common to other translators. The Toledan chapter had a vast economical availability. The extension of the Metropolitan Sea covered large parts of Castile and received the ninth part of the tithe of the Episcopacy and the tenth part of the Kingdom taxation as well as many direct contributions from the crown. Since all the members of the Toledan chapter received substantial prebends and raciones, one should agree with Fernández Comte in considering this advanced system of economic benefices as one of the main factors used to finance the Toledan translations. During the second half of the 12th century, Toledo was, thus, the perfect place where a series of scientific and philosophical translations could be pursued. And indeed, the most famous translator of the time, Gerard of Cremona, is in Toledo at least from 1157, arriving aimed at finding and translating Ptolemy's Almagest, a desire shared also by Hermann of Corinthia, who was less fortunate on this respect. During the 30 years that Gerard spends in Toledo, he translates into Latin more than 60 writings. The extant eulogy prepared by his students offers a list of the translations realized by Gerard, a list that is impressive for the topics, the authors and the works Gerard dealt with. As we can see, many of the translated works are scientific writings dealing with astronomy, medicine, mathematics, with authors as Alfragani, Geminus of Rhodes, Theodosius, Galen, Euclid, but also works on astrology and geomancy. At the very same time, we find in this list many important works on philosophy of Islamic, Jewish and Greek authors, Al-Kindi, Al-Farabi, Isaac Israeli and, crucially, Aristotle. Gerard translated from Arabic into Latin five Aristotelian writings, the posterior analytics, physics, de cello, de generazione in corruzione, methera. 
to these five, one should add two pseudo-Aristotelian treatises, the Liber de Causis et Proprietatum Elementorum, and, even more important, the Liber de Expositione Bonitatis Pure, that is to say, the Liber de Causis. For the realization of these translations, Gerard worked in team with a Mozarabe, Gallipus, following a biphasic translating method that is shared by many authors, among whom Gondisalinus. The first collaborator translated from Arabic into Spanish vernacular, while the second translated the vernacular into Latin. As I mentioned before, Gerard's activity seems to be directly bound to his presence in the Toledan chapter. Indeed, the capitulary archives precise Gerard's position as magister, a position that supposedly covered and funded also his work as translator. Moreover, it is extremely probable that the Toledan chapter provided a kind of scholastic institution for the clergy, that is to say, a cathedral school. The references to Gerard as magister seem to corroborate this hypothesis. Indeed, after the Council of Coyanza in 1050, cathedral schools were established throughout the Iberian Peninsula, actuating the aforementioned, aforementioned requirement of the Gregorian reform. This fact, nonetheless, does not entail the cathedral school of Toledo be a translation school, a hypothesis proposed decades ago by Valentin Rose and already refuted by many scholars. But it could perhaps be linked to the subsequent medieval legends on a Toledan school of necromancy. Gerard of Cremona died in Toledo in 1187, and thus he spent in the Castilian capital more than 30 years working on a vast number of Latin translations. For the most part of this period, it was active in Toledo another team of translators, on which I would like to focus our attention, for it has been a quite peculiar team whose production will have a pivotal history of the effects. I am referring to what Charles Burnett called the Gundesalinus Circle, and thus to the person naming the circle, Dominicus Gundesalinus. Gundisalinus, Gundisalvo, Gundisalvi, or even Gundisalinus. The problem began to arise from the very consideration of the name of this translator. Some manuscripts, as the translation of Avicenna's Philosophia Prima, conserved in Paris, Bibliothèque Nationale de France, Latin 6443, displayed the reading Dominicus Gundisalvi. Other manuscripts present the reading Dominicus Gundisalvus, as the version of the same text in Oxford Bodleian Library, DB217, while further manuscripts have a whole different rendering of the author's name. At the same time, the diachronic examination of the manuscript tradition seems to be ineffective or even misleading without a previous philological examination of the whole tradition. Nonetheless, some important data can be traced by the manuscript survey. In the first place, one should note that the tradition is consistent in naming the author Dominicus, while the main differences are related to the second part of the name. By this perspective, one should consider that the group of possible variants on the term following the name Dominicus has to be referred to the patronymic of the author and thus that the term should be in a genitive case. Since the name Gundi Salvus was a very common name on medieval Castile, and a pretty large number of people has this name and is attested in Toledo's capitulary archive. The most correct of the possible renderings of the patronymic is Gundi Salvi. Therefore, if those remarks are true, the actual name of the author should be Dominicus Gundi Salvi, and the common use of Gundi Salinus seem to respond to the adjectivation of the name, subsequently rendered as a substantive and nowadays commonly used to refer to him. Examination of the manuscript tradition cast some light on the actual duty Gundisalinus had. Many witnesses are consistent with the description of the Toledan philosopher as Archidiaconus Toledi, yeah. while others present a more precise statement of his role as Archidiaconus Segoviensis Apud Toletum. 
Archdeacon of Segovia in Toledo. The Capitulary Archives in Segovia and Toledo, as well as the archive in Burgos, present some important documents. Dated since 1148 until 1181, that can be directly referred to a Dominicus Archidiaconus, who is to be identified with Dominicus Gundisalvi. The first document witnessing Gundisalinus in Castel is dated May 6, 1148, and states the presence of Dominicus Archidiaconus in Segovia. A second document clarifies his duty on the Segovian chapter and refers to him as Dominicus Archidiaconus Collarensis, that is, Archdeacon of Cuellar, a small town not far from Segovia. Gondisalinus spent at least 13 years in Segovia as Archdeacon of Cuellar, since the last document witnessing his presence there is dated February 1161. After that moment, Gondisalinus presumably moved to Toledo, where he appears for the first time in the Capitulary Archive in 1162. Unfortunately, neither the town archive in Cuellar nor the Scovian chapter give further news on Gundisalinus' activity during these years and, even though some preliminary hypotheses can be traced, this question seems to be condemned to an unsolved mystery until and whether new data will be provided. One should notice an important aspect on Gundisalinus' presence in Segovia. Indeed, in 1149, John of Castelmoron is elected Bishop of Segovia, and for the next three years he supposedly met Gundisalinus often in the everyday cathedral activity. Then, in 1152, John is elected Archbishop of Toledo, with the name of John II, and he will be the main sponsor of the translation movement that was beginning to develop in that town. Moreover, John seems to be responsible of Gundisalinus' transfer to Toledo, but in order to understand, to understand the reasons why I say so, we have to consider another intriguing figure of that time, the Jewish philosopher Abraham im Dawood. Abraham im Dawood, or in the Latinized version of his name Aven Daud, is Gundisalinus' main collaborator to the translations of Avicenna but he is also an important philosopher of Aristotelian and Avicennian tradition. By this viewpoint, important studies have pointed out that the very choice of translating Avic the Avicennian corpus can be imputed to Imdaud's decision for the high consideration he had of Avicenna's works. Unfortunately, the extant data do not provide a comprehensive biography of Imdaud. What we know is that he should be born in Al-Andalus and fled the south for the Almohad invasion of the peninsula. The first attested presence of Imdawud in Toledo is about 1161. Supposedly, around that time, he realizes the very first translation into Latin of a writing by Avicenna, the notorious prologue to the Liber Sufficientia, that is, the Kitaba Shifa. This translation is accompanied by a dedicatory letter to the Toledo Archbishop, John II, an important document eminently studied by Amos Bertolacci. Bertolacci points out that the purpose of this letter is the very persuasion of the recipient, that is, the Archbishop of Toledo, to sponsor a series of translations of the whole Avicennian corpus of the Kitaba Shifa. This practice, common amongst Jewish philosophers, should probably be related to Gerard's translate, translating activity that had already begun since Gerard is in Toledo, at least since 1157. The passage from the dedicatory letter of the prologue to the Liber Sufficientia is bound with another dedicatory letter, that of the Latin translation of Avicenna's De Anima. The recipient is the very same Archbishop John II, but something has changed. Indeed, as Bertolacci remarks, the realization of the Latin translation of Avicenna's De Anima displays that Im Dawood actually convinced John II to sponsor the translation of Avicenna's works. But there's more. While the prologue to the Liber Sufficientiae has been realized by Im Dawood only, the De Anima is translated by Im Dawood and Dominicus Gundisalinus. In the latter, 
Monte Salino's position is rather secondary. The sender, and thus the main translator, is Imdawud, while Gundi Salinus appears only in the final part of the letter, where Imdawud describes the biphasic method adopted. By these remarks, one should infer that, in the first place, the translation of Avicenna's De Anima follows that of the prologue, and, in the second place, both of them have been realized before 1166, since the De Anima is dedicated to John II. In the third place, finally, the De Anima has to be realized after 1162, the year when Gundisalinus is attested for the first time in Toledo. Now, as we have seen, Abraham Im Daoud asked John II to sponsor his project and, by debt and implicitly, to provide him economical resources and practical means to pursue that translating project. Among these means, one should imagine that Im Daoud also required a learned Latinist with philosophical skills that could allow him to correctly translate into Latin the dense and difficult text by Avicenna. Surely, John II already knew Gundisalinus, since he was the Archbishop of Segovia while Gundisalinus was member of that chapter. And by knowing him, he was surely aware of both his learned education and his excellent knowledge of Latin. It seems quite probable, thus, that Gundisalinus arrived in Toledo in 1162 as a consequence of Imdaud's translating project, under the appointment of John II. This possibility would also clarify why Gondisalino is in a pretty secondary position in the second dedicatory letter. It was his first translation of Avicenna, participating into a project developed by Imdawud. The role played by Gondisalinos will be progressively wider and deeper. Nevertheless, the origins of the Avicennian translations into Latin are to be found in Imdawud's project. For, the, for this reason, the best denomination of the cultural context in which Imdawud and Gundisalinus worked is surely that of Gundisalinus' circle proposed by Charles Barnett, a circle where scientific and philosophical works were translated, studied, and elaborated by Gundisalinus, Imdawud, and possibly Johannes Hispanus. The activity of this circle is to be related also to the school education received by Gundisalinus before appearing in Segovia in 1148. Practically all the scholars dealing with Gundisalinus agree with the hypothesis of Gundisalinus' study in Chart, possibly with William of Conch or and with theory of Chart. In fact, in Gundisalinus' original works, he shows a deep and intimate knowledge of Williams and Thierry's writings, reflections and sources while there are no traces of a similar knowledge of further contemporary philosophers besides Hugo of Saint Victor. Gunisalinus spent in Toledo around 20 years. The last quotation of his name among the members of the chapter dates 1178, but it is almost certain that Gunisalinus remained in Toledo a bit longer, without participating in the chapter. Indeed, the last Toledan document testifying his presence concerns the selling of a terrain, written in Arabic and dates 1181, registering the sale of a terrain owned by Gundisalinus. After that year, it's quite probable that he went back to Segovia, since the very last extant document witnessing him alive is the account of a meeting between the chapters of Segovia and Burgos held in Segovia in 1190 to which Gundisalinus participated. After 1190, no extant source present Gundisalinus' name and therefore we do not have an exact date of his death. A terminus antequem can be fixed in 1198, when a new archdeacon of Cuellar is mentioned by the Capitulary Archive of Toledo. The new archdeacon is John, whom Charles Barnett and Juan Francisco Rivera identify with one of Gundisalinus' collaborators. Johannes Hispanus. During the 20 years of his activity, Gundisalinus translated more than 20 philosophical works from Arabic into Latin. The authors chosen by Gundisalinus and his circle are all Muslim or Jewish, apart from Alexander of Aphrodisias, who was the intellectual intellecto, is the only originally Greek text 
translated by Gunis Salinos through the Arabic mediation. Thanks to the new discoveries by Dag Hasse, a comprehensive list of Gunis Salinos' translations counts the following books. Alexander of Rhodesias, The Intellectuit Intellecto, Alfrabi's Expositio, Libri Quinti Elementato, Elementorum Euclidis, The Intellectuit Intellecto, Fontes Questionum, Liber Exercitationis Ad Viam Felicitatis, De Ortu Scienziarum. Then we have Al Ghazali's Summa Theoriche Philosophie, Al Kindis, The Intellectu, De Mutatione Temporum, temporum and De Radis. And Al Kindis accompanied by the Ijuana Safa with their In Artem Logiche Demonstrationis, and Isaac Israeli with the De Definitionibus. Then we have the fundamental work by Solomon in Gabriel, the Fons Vitae, the anonymous Turba Philosophorum, and crucially, a conspicuous number of works by Avicenna, the De Anima, the Convenientia and Differentia Subjectorum, the Liber de Philosophia Prima, the Isagoge 1 2, the first three books of Physica, the Diluvis, the Virbus Codis, and the Pseudo Avicennian Liber Celiat Mundi. These translations have in common some stylistic peculiarities as a certain degree of literality on the Latin due to the verbo adverbal method and the use of neologism and calques from the Arabic aspects that are accompanied by a peculiar attention to the Latin rendering of the text. Uli Salinus does not just translate this text, he studies them speculates on them and sometimes criticizes them. Gundi Salinos indeed is a learned scholar of his time, who felt the despicable state of the philosophical debate contemporary to him. Willing to renovate the Latin philosophical debate, Gundi Salinos writes some interesting works, whose precise number is still a matter of debate. Traditionally, the original writings by Gundi Salinus are sex, De Unitate et Uno, De Immortalitate Anime, De Sciences, De Anima, De Divisione Philosophie, De Processione Mundi. To these writings, at least a further one should be added, that is the Liber Mahamalet, whose production is directly related to Gundis Lino's theme, as pointed out by Charles Burnett. Now, many scholars have pointed out that the author of the De Immortalitate Anime is William of Auvergne, rather than Dominicus Gundis Salinus. This writing has indeed an ambiguous manuscript tradition and a passage against the theory of universal ilomorphism, one of Gundis Salinus' doctrinal points par excellence, makes difficult to accept his authorship, even though many further data go in that direction. At the same time, the De Sciences has a very peculiar stylistic nature, since it is a creative translation of the Kitabi Sahalulum of Al Farabi translated by both Gerard of Cremona and Gundis Salinus. But while Gerard's version is literal and close to the original Arabic text by Al-Farabi, Gundis Salinus' version suffers a wide degree of textual and doctrinal alteration. For Gundis Salinus cuts many passages he didn't agree with, modifies other parts of the text, and in general reshapes the whole writing in something that has a hybrid literary statue for it's neither a pure translation nor a pure original writing. Thus, the number of Gundisalinian works commonly accepted by scholarship is four. De Unitatet Uno, De Anima, De Divisione Philosophie, and De Processione Mundi. In these four texts is condensed Gundisalinus' attempt at renovating the Latin discussion on three main topics psychology, epistemology, and metaphysics, and in all these three aspects, Gunis Salinus acts a quite peculiar synthesis among Latin and Arabic sources. We will have the opportunity to discuss all these in our next meetings. If the apex of the Trilatan translation movement is met with the works by Gerard of Cremona and Dominicus Gundis Salinus, the circle is closed by another important figure of that period, Michael Scott. With Michael, the Arabic into Latin Iberian movement joins the Greek into Latin, Latin Sicilian translation movement. For Michael, Scott finally moves from Toledo to Palermo and there becomes the court astrologer of Emperor Frederick II. As an Arabic into Latin translator, Michael marks a shift. In Toledo, 
In the second decade of the 13th century, he translates Albitrugi, that is Albitragius, the Sphera, the biological treatise by Aristotle and Avicenna. But his contribution is crucial as regards to making available to the Latin philosophers the works by Averroes. And Michael indeed translates seven fundamental works by Averroes that will reshape the Latin philosophical debate. With Averroes, was works began to circulate throughout Europe around 1220-1225, everything was supposed to change, and the 13th century reflection will be drastically marked by his shadow. Thus, around the third decade of the 13th century, the circle is completed. Aristotle, Avicenna and Averroes were finally at disposal for natural philosophy and metaphysics, while all the major sources on astronomy, medicine and many other sciences were now available to the Latin scholars. The cultural landscape had changed so profoundly that a comparison with the beginning of the 12th century, before the translation movement, would be unhappy. The first signs of this abrupt change are the condemnations of David of Dean and Almeric of Bean, and later Mauritius Hispanus in Paris in 1210-1215. Condemnations accompanied by the supposed origins of those mistaken speculations, Aristotle's natural philosophy and its commentators, namely Avicenna. Before those condemnations, the new text translated into Latin spread throughout Latin Europe, and the Latin philosophers faced the urgency of a first attempt at assimilation and criticism, beginning with the very translator of Avicenna, Dominicus Gundisalinus. This will be the theme of our next meeting, centered on Gundisalinus' reception of the Arabic sources and his curious theoretical fusion with the Latin tradition regarding metaphysics and cosmology. As for now, I thank you very much for your attention and I leave you with a basic bibliography of studies on the Toledan translation movement. Thank you very much indeed for your time and attention.